everybody. Can you hear me? Perfect. Great to see some thumbs ups and nugget nodding here. Um, so I'm Teresa. I'm a product manager at the developer ecosystem team. And today we're going to have this lightning talk about different tools for improving the developer experience. But to get us started, let's talk a little bit about what does the developer ecosystem do? What does this entail? So essentially, it's everything that sits outside of the platform and interacts with it. So that's everything from your open API models and the SDKs built on top of it, all the way to your IDE plugins. That team was actually started in 2022 and they built everything from scratch. And really the mission was to make sure that we have this layer cake where one thing builds on top of the other and we can automate processes. So for example, if a new API becomes available, we want you to be able to access it in a matter of days and not weeks. Also a little tip uh, in my coming slides, you'll see I'll have some QR codes on the top. So if there's anything you find interesting, if you scan the QR codes, it will take you directly to the documentation where you can learn more about it. All right, let's get started. Um, so on the bottom of this layer cake, we have the Databricks SDKs. But why do we need the Databricks SDKs? If you've used the Databricks REST APIs before, you know, there's a lot to it. So just, I brought you a few numbers, but just to mention one, there's 600 methods across 80 services. And that can make it very challenging for you developers or your colleagues to navigate this, to build code consistently and to scale that. So that's why to make this easier, the goal of the SDKs was to you know, provide SDKs that use idiomatic language that are complete, so they span across all the APIs that are consistent in the way that they give you access to patterns, such as for pagination, and that also use unified authentication. So there's one way to specify your authentication parameters, which will then be respected by the SDK, and as a result, by all the other tools that built on top of the SDK. And finally, we wanted to have minimal dependencies to make it easy for you guys to integrate. At the moment, we have a few core SDKs. We have Go, Python, Java, and JavaScript. But there's more. Uh, Databricks Labs, for example, also has an R SDK. Um, they are production ready. We actually have over 10,000 customers using them, and we handle billions of requests across services. But if that doesn't convince you, we also have over 40 Databricks solutions built on top of them. That includes our CLI, Terraform, the VS Code extension, and UCX, which is a tool for migrating to Unity Catalog. But to really drive home this point, I brought an example for you today. So without the SDKs, let's say you wanted to list all new objects in your workspace. Previously, you'd have to find the right documentation. You had to figure out, how do I authenticate? Where is the right REST API spec? You need to write the request. You need to pass the response. Figure out what kind of pagination is it using. Maybe recursively list your directories. Um, and then if you wanted to extend the use case, potentially you'd have to start again. But now, with, for example, the Python SDK, all of these use cases can be addressed in, for example, using three to four lines of code. So really the bottom line of the SDKs is we want you to be able to focus on your business logic and not figuring out Databricks APIs. As I mentioned, we have this layer cake where one tool builds on top of the other. Um, so I already kind of said um, the CLI is one of those tool tools built on top of the SDKs. So that's what I'm going to talk about next. So just to give you a little bit of an overview of what our customers are using the CLI for, these are things like ad hoc experimentation, maybe you want to do some scripting, you want to make some API calls, but you can also manage your authentication profiles or sync code from your local IDE to the workspace if you want to. These are just some of the most common um, use cases that we have. Uh, it also leverages unified authentication, as I said, because it is built on the SDKs, which respect that in every tool on top of that as well. And I also want to point out that the CLI has command groups. Um, what are command groups? It's essentially just a set of related commands and subcommands. Um, we have them for topics like uh, of groups like the workspace, workflows, compute. And we also have a really great command line help I want to point out. So just if you, for example, use Databricks, the command group, and then the help flag, it will tell you what you can do with them and how you can use them. So it's a really great resource if you're getting started to get an understanding of what is possible. There's one command group that is uh, very special to us that I want to talk about a little bit more today, which are our, which are our Databricks asset bundles, or DABs as we like to call them. Um, they just went GA recently, um, and we've seen great adoption. So I'm going to tell you today what are Databricks asset bundles, why should you be using them, and also some of the great features that the team has implemented. So what are DAVs? Essentially, they are a way for you to describe your resources and your code in a declarative way using YAML files. So you can imagine you can have a bundle where you have your job, your pipeline, your notebook, all kind of grouped together. 
Um, we are currently already supporting quite um, a wide array of assets and resources, but we're always working on expanding that. Um, to get started, or if you, if, you, if you don't understand what kind of structures such, such a bundle should have, we have pre-made templates to help you. That is, um, we have a Python template, we have one for machine learning, but we've also recently updated the ones for DBT and SQL. However, you can also use your custom templates um, if you have you know, a specific structure that you want to follow, uh, but a little bit more about that uh, later. Why should you be using the apps? So as I said, you have this bundle. And with that, you can really co-author, co-version, and co-deploy this bundle as one unit while implementing software development best practices. So everything from source control, code review, testing, CI, CD, all of this is made possible. Um, additionally, it helps um, improve developer productivity by fostering collaboration and streamlining different processes. For example, promoting your code from that staging to production. Um, yeah, so these are just some of the reasons why. Uh, finally, I want to point out uh, some of the great features the team has been building on. So, for example, if you already have an existing job or pipeline in the workspace, you can very easily, through one command, generate adapts from that. That's something we'll see um, in a demo in a moment. Next, we have target overrides. So, for example, if you have different configurations for your dev or your prod setup, that is also something we can leverage. Um, we also support uh, modular configurations using variables and lookups. We support uh, shared code and libraries. And you can even automate your deployments using your favorite CI CD system. As I said, if you want to get started, if you're curious now, one way is uh, you already have a job or pipeline in the Databricks workspace and you want to generate a Databricks asset bundle from here. Um, just before I play this video, I'm going to tell you about the three ingredients that are part of this. Firstly, we need to understand the context. That's why we do need a root Databricks YAML file. This can be generated using our regular initialization command Databricks bundle init. Secondly, we need the generate command. What that does is it, it, it basically takes a snapshot of the configuration you currently have in the workspace and uh, will give you yeah, the bundle config file for that. However, if you know where to deploy that kind of configuration that we auto-generated for you, it would be creating a new job. And that's why we need the third ingredient, which links that Databricks as a bundle you've created to the existing job in the workspace. And that is our bind command. All right, let's put it all together and take a look of what it looks like in uh, what it looks like in practice. All right, I'm here in my terminal. If I haven't authenticated yet, that's also something I'm gonna do just using Databricks of login and my URL. I can create a profile if I wanna easily log in going forward. Next, I need to set this context that I mentioned. Um, and that's why I'm using Databricks bundle init. Here in my case, I'm not selecting any example files because I really want the ones that I already have as part of this job uh, to then be kind of like downloaded for me. So now we see this um, project scaffolding where I have the Databricks YAML file and a resources folder created. So the next step, as I mentioned, is we have to generate the resource configuration. So I run Databricks bundle generate job using the existing job IDE that I can easily get from the workspace. Yes, so that takes one moment to load. And then you see we have this new devs demo job YAML file in the resources folder that has been created for us. And a source folder also has been added where the, the notebook files, for example, have been attached to the job have been pulled to. Next, I need to use the bind command. So Databricks bundle deployment bind using the resource key. So devs demo job in my example and the job ID to really link them together and to make sure when I update the Databricks asset bundle, it will also be reflected in the workspace for that exact job. So what that will do is that will give me a diff between the two. I need to confirm this. And finally, in order to apply the, the changes, uh, I need to deploy. So I need to run Databricks bundle deploy and sp specify my target. In my case, uh, that is dev. Once I do that, these changes will take effect. And that will also be reflected in the Databricks workspace. So you'll see in a moment when I switch back to the workspace, we've now implemented a UI for jobs where you can see or very easily identify when the page is reloaded, now it's no longer called Dabs Demo Job, but it's, it's been renamed that it's been, it's Teresa, it's been deployed to the dev target. And also um, if I wanna directly edit it from the UI, I have to disconnect it from the source. Finally, I'm just gonna quickly illustrate also if I run my Databricks asset bundle from here and then switch back to the workspace. So once I select the resource to run, uh, you'll also see that it's being updated and it's now running. 
So that's just to give you um, a little bit of an overview, but as I said, also the QR code right there um, to find the exact section in our documentation. Yes, um, finally, so next, I'm gonna move on to talk about our IDE, but that doesn't mean that we leave the Databricks asset bundle topic completely behind just yet. All right, so before we get into our VF code extension, I just wanna preface that you can also connect uh, to, from other IDEs that might not have an extension using something called Databricks Connect. But it is a separate team and there's also a lot to it, um, but just as a little disclaimer that you're not relying on the plugins. However, we have built a VS Code extension. And uh, I believe around last year, the SEM Summit, the old or like the first version ran into GA. But now we've been working on a new version. And what's different with the new version? It has native DApps integration and it has a more guided setup and authentication flow to make it easier for customers. Um, it's currently in preview. You can actually already access it through the pre-release version um, in the VS Code marketplace. So if you want, feel free to try it out. Uh, also, feel free to shoot us an email, then we can point you to the right documentation, and we, ha we have a little guide as well to make sure you have all the right guidance to get you started. All right, so I'm going to show you now this, this little demonstration, um, which will highlight the authentication part and also the project initialization using dApps. Here, just one little point, because I said um, custom templates as well before. So we do have these pre-made templates that you can select from here, but you are not limited to that. You can also customize them, for example, specifying as you, see, as, you see, as, you see, as you've seen, there's like a little bit of um, inputs you have to provide. So you can customize that part, you can customize the folder structure, you can do some con um, custom configuration uh, on like the, the bundle config. So there are ways um, to you know, really um, adjust it to your use case. All right, let's get into it. So I'm in the VS Code extension. I can select from creating a new Databricks project or migrating to a Databricks project. Um, it's, if it's the first time I'm logging in, I need to um, specify the workspace I'm gonna be using. And then I can select if I want to use OAuth or personal access token for authentication. If you create profiles, it makes it very easy to, to manage going forward because you can simply switch between them. And now we're taken to this initialization flow. We have the default Python template here and the MLOps stack by default, but you can also use custom ones. I'm just going to take the Python one. I'm going to call my project demo project. And in this case, now I'm actually going to include some of the sample files because I'm getting started in, on a new project. And I want to understand what's the structure, what are the files, and maybe orient myself using that. So you see the project scaffolding has been done for me, again, with this Databricks YAML root file, and then the resources folder with the separate YAML files for my job and my pipeline for better organization, and then the notebooks that I've selected to be generated in the source folder. Now going back to the extension, <clears throat> you'll see there's two sections. There's the configuration on the top and the bundle resource explorer on the bottom. So in the configuration, I can also select a cluster. And what will that allow me to do is when I do development, so this is only for dev, I can actually override anything I've specified in my Databricks asset bundle. Um, just so you know, reduce cluster startup time if you're developing interactively and make it a better experience. Um, secondly, we have this Python setup flow to help you get the right virtual environment set up. Where just like through the click of a few button, we help you make sure that all the right libraries are installed, and then within the click of a button, you can also install Databricks Connect in the right place, because this is something we've seen customers struggle with in the past. Um, then in a moment, once all of this is done, you will see that all of the, all the check marks are, marks are ticked, and that is an indication for you. I can get started. I can use all the capabilities of the VS Code extension. Now moving on to the Bundle uh, Resource Explorer. I can deploy from here with the click of a button. I can, I can run and deploy, which I'm doing here where I then kind of then follow in the output terminal what, what is currently happening. But this is really the differentiation, right? To bring this UI element to using dApps instead of doing everything from the CLI. Additionally, it's kind of giving me the structure of my YAML file. So it's also a nice way to, to see what has the Databricks extension uh, picked up on and is this what I am expecting and giving me a bit of an overview, which is especially helpful if I'm managing big projects. Additionally, once it starts running, it can just take a moment. Um, you'll actually see you can also kind of follow where I'm currently at, uh, which task is currently running, uh, where is an error come up, et cetera, all of these things. Yes, so as I said, it, it just takes a moment, but we're almost there. Perfect. Yes, so now you see the run status has jumped to running. I can expand the different task sections and see where it's, we're currently at. I can cancel the job from here, or use the little arrows to open, um, you know, different resources in the workspace as well. 
Perfect. So that's it. I hope that gave you a little bit of a, a sneak peek into, into this like new VS Code version and we'll, we'll be really excited for you to try it out as well. However, if you're not familiar with our previous version, there's more to our VS Code extension. We also support uh, debugging and server cell execution. That is done using Databricks Connect, um, so that must be enabled for this to work. And for those of you who don't know what Databricks Connect does, essentially it runs your Spark code on the cluster. All right, let's look at, into this demo. So you see Databricks Connect is enabled on the bottom, and what that means is that I can now just click on the cell and execute it and get my results displayed here, just like if I was working on a notebook. I could also run the entire file from the Databricks Play button on the top. And then I can also set breakpoints in, uh, in my cell and debug on a cell-by-cell -cell basis. That will then you know, give me access to debugging controls and the variables. For example, here I have a data frame, and through the debug console, I could be then accessing it. For example, I'm just here using DF show, very trivial, but to show you that you can actually do some debugging here. I can also do debugging on a Python file. It, it really is very similar. So if I switch to my Python file where I have a breakpoint set, I can simply go this time to the same place where I can run the entire file, but select debug with um, Databricks Connect instead. And that then again, you know, will bring up the familiar debugging controls and allow you to step through your code and do step through debugging. All right, that's in a nutshell some of the other main features we have in our VS Code extension. And that concludes kind of like the, yeah, the information I wanted to cover and give you kind of like a taste for. Um, but just to recap, because I think a lot of customers also get confused by when should I be using which tools? What are Databricks recommendations for that? Especially when it comes to Terraform and Devs. And I have to say Terraform I have not mentioned yet, uh, but it is still there. Um, all right, so I think from our perspective, we see Terraform as a tool that is used by the admins and the DevOps engineers amongst yourselves. So that is really to create resources, to manage the permissions, to look after things like um, environment portability and disaster recovery. Whereas DAPS is really for your, the data scientists, the data engineers among you that want to manage their data pipelines in a way that you know, uses CI, CD and software development best practices without having to learn a tool such as Terraform. Um, yes, and just to quickly round it off, um, I'm going to briefly mention what the use cases for some of the other tools are as well. So as I said, the CLI is mainly used for things like ad hoc experimentation, if you want to do scripting and write, write shell one-liners, and finally, if you want to sync code from the IDE to the workspace. The SDKs, which maybe you've already forgotten about, it's been a while since we heard about them, um, they're there so you can integrate with the de existing deployment system or create custom Databricks workflows or create even new web services if you want to. And finally, the, the IDE plugins, I think that's probably the most intuitive one. It's just to make your life easier if you want to um, you know, develop uh, using an IDE. All right, finally, um, let's talk about the next steps. This is just a little sneak peek about what we have in store for you. So what, what we are working on at the moment is, for example, uh, something called PyDabs. Some of you might have heard of it already. That's currently in private preview. And it's a Python SDK for dabs, essentially. So it allows you to write idiomatic Python code to define your workflows. Um, additionally, we're working to bring dabs in the workspace. And uh, earlier today, we also announced uh, the private preview for a new Databricks PyCharm plugin that JetBrains have been working on. So if that's something you're interested in, this will be run by JetBrains, but we can get you in touch and we'd love to hear your feedback. Finally, more from the, the SDK, SDK side, I guess, uh, from an interest perspective, we're also partnering with our machine learning teams to provide low lat latency bindings for model serving endpoints. However, if you want to learn more, we have quite a few people around from the developer ecosystem team. There's a few talks happening. I've put that on the slides for you as well. Um, so if you want to learn more about in general, the IDEs, Databricks asset bundles, or uh, CICD, we have a few talks lined up for you. I know some of them were initially uh, booked out, but there are some repeat sessions that have been added. So we would love to see you there. Also, if you're interested in joining any of the private previews, I would urge you to read out, reach out to your account team or if you have any other feedback or question for us, we'd really love to hear it. Um, yeah, I think that that was it for me today. I really hope you learned something and maybe you already have some ideas of how you can improve the developer experience at your company. And uh, we have one hour, 30 minutes, so maybe we can take uh, one or two questions if you want. Or alternatively, I have a few colleagues from the team around as well, so you can find us later for a little chat as well. All right, then, thank you so much for being here today. Um, and yeah, enjoy the rest of the, of the summit and have a great rest of the day.